In this video, we're going to talk about basic properties that all groups satisfy. These properties are things that are going to simplify calculations when we get back to talking about examples of groups in the coming videos. I'd like to start by reminding you about the definition of a group from last time. A group is a pair consisting of a set together with a binary operation, which satisfies three properties. Number one, the binary operation is associative. Number two, there's an element in G called the identity element, with the property that, for any G and G, when you combine the identity element from the left or from the right with G using your binary operation, you don't change G. And number three, for every G and G, there exists an H and G such that when you combine G with H, either as G star H or as H star G, you recover the identity element. That element H is called the inverse of G. And you'll remember that property number two is what we referred to as existence of identity, and property number three is what we referred to as existence of inverses. In the previous video, we also saw a number of examples of groups. And one thing which I'd like you to notice is that in some groups, the binary operation is most naturally thought of as an additive operation, while in others, the binary operation is more naturally thought of as a multiplicative operation. Of course, this is all somewhat psychological, but I'm telling you this because when we're working with groups, sometimes we will treat the binary operation as if it were some form of addition, and sometimes we'll treat it as if it were some form of multiplication. And that's gonna be reflected in two different kinds of notations which we use, which I'll talk about in a minute. Now, for some groups, it's not clear whether or not the binary operation is more like addition or multiplication. But in situations like that, we usually lean towards the multiplicative notation for working with group elements. I'd like to now try to explain in more detail what the differences are between the two different kinds of notation that we're gonna see. If we have a group G where the binary operation is most naturally thought of as an additive operation, then we might write G star H as G plus H. But if the binary operation is more naturally thought of as a multiplicative operation, then we might write G star H just as GH. Similarly, in groups where the binary operation is more like some form of addition, we usually refer to the identity element as zero and the inverse of an element G as minus G. Whereas if the group operation is more like multiplication, then we usually refer to the identity element as one and to the inverse of an element G as G inverse. If we want to combine an element G with itself n times, where n is some natural number, then in additive notation, we would denote that by writing NG. Whereas in multiplicative notation, we would write g to the n. Similarly, as a convention, when we're working in additive notation, we define zero g to just be the identity element. And when we're working in multiplicative notation, we define g to the zero, again, to be the identity element. And finally, if n is a natural number, then we define minus ng in additive notation to be the additive inverse of g added to itself n times. In multiplicative notation, we define g to the minus n to be the multiplicative inverse of G multiplied with itself n times. As I said before, this is all somewhat psychological. It's just two different notations for the same thing. And the main thing to keep track of when you're working in a group is whether you're viewing the group multiplicatively or additively, especially when you're working with a set like the integers, for example, where there's two different natural ways to combine elements of the set. You have to be careful not to get confused here. Of course, the integers are only a group under addition and not multiplication. So if you were working in the integers as a group, that would be a cue to you that you probably wanna think about it using additive notation. I'd like to mention a couple more notational conventions before we go further. From the definition, we know that a group is a set together with a binary operation that satisfies certain properties. However, a lot of times we'll refer to the group as just the set itself if it's clear what the binary operation is. So using the example that we just talked about, if we're talking about the integers as a group and we're not specifying the binary operation, then of course you have to assume that the binary operation is addition because the integers are not a group under multiplication. If I were using some other weird binary operation to turn the integers into a group, then the burden would be on me to explain that because the most natural thing is to think about the integers as being a group under the operation of addition. Another definition, which is pretty obvious, if we say that a group is a finite group, we just mean that the cardinality of the set G, which is also called the order of G, is a finite number. In later videos, we'll also talk about the orders of elements of G, but that's not something that you need to think about right now. So when we talk about the order of a group G, we just mean the cardinality of the set G, defining the group. 
Now let's get to talking about properties of groups. The first property is one that I mentioned in the previous video, and it's called uniqueness of identity. What it says is that if there are two elements, E and E tilde, which both satisfy the second condition in the definition of the group, then they have to be equal to each other. In other words, in a group, there's only one identity element. There can never be more than that. We're going to go really slowly through the proofs of these results, because I want you to see how they follow in this abstract setting, just from the three properties in the definition of a group. So to prove uniqueness of identity, let's suppose that I have two identity elements. Now, I'm not necessarily assuming that these are different, so I'm aiming to prove that they're actually equal to each other. Well, if I have two elements which both satisfy property number two in the definition of a group, first of all, since E tilde is an identity element, if I multiply E times E tilde, it's not going to change E. So E must be equal to E times E tilde. Now, thinking about this the other way around, since I'm assuming that E is an identity element, when I multiply E times E tilde, it also doesn't change E tilde. So I conclude that E must be equal to E tilde, and that proves the uniqueness of the identity element in a group. The second property, which I may have mentioned before, is uniqueness of inverses. Now, property number three in the definition of a group guarantees that every element G in the group has an inverse H. And what uniqueness of inverses says is that that inverse element is unique. So that if you had two elements, H and H tilde, which both satisfied the conditions for being inverses of G, then they would have to be equal to each other. To see why this is true, let's suppose that H and H tilde both satisfy the conditions for being inverses of the element G. Then, first of all, I can write H as E times H, and that's just from properties of the identity element. Next, because H tilde is an inverse of G, I know that the identity element is equal to H tilde times G. And next, by associativity, I can move the parentheses over, and I find that this is equal to H tilde times GH. But since H is also an inverse of G, the quantity in the parentheses here is the identity element. And finally, again, using the properties of the identity element, H tilde times E is just H tilde. That shows that H and H tilde are actually equal to each other, so it proves that the inverse of any element in a group must be unique. The third property is what's called the cancellation laws. And what it says is that if you have three elements, G, H, and A of your group G, which satisfy the conditions AG equals AH or GA equals HA, then it has to be the case that G is equal to H. In other words, in either circumstance, you can cancel out the A by multiplying on the left or on the right by A inverse. And in fact, that's exactly how the proof works. So first of all, suppose that AG is equal to AH. Then multiplying both sides of this equation on the left by A inverse, and then using associativity together with the property of inverses, we find that G must be equal to H. One thing to notice about the cancellation laws is that we've stated the two conditions AG equals AH and GA equals HA separately. Because remember, we're not assuming that the binary operation is commutative. If we were assuming that our group G was an abelian group, then for AG to equal AH would be the same as for GA to equal HA. Then we wouldn't need to state both of these conditions as possible hypotheses of the proof. However, if it turns out that GA equals HA, then the proof is really not that much different. The only difference is that in the second step, we need to multiply on the right by A inverse instead of on the left. Besides that, all of the mechanics of the proof work the same way, and we arrive at the desired conclusion that G is equal to H. Therefore, that proves the cancellation laws. The next property that all groups satisfy is what's called generalized associativity, or the generalized associative law. Remember that the associative law just said that when you're multiplying three elements of the group together, it doesn't matter where you put the parentheses. Well, the generalized associative law says the same thing for products of n elements where n is any natural number. So for example, if n is 4, when I'm multiplying four elements of the group together, if I decide to multiply the first two together first, and then the last two, and then multiply the products of those together, I'll get the same answer as if I do the multiplications using any other choice of parentheses around the terms. Now, this is not difficult to prove, but it does involve a slightly tricky induction on n. And since I don't think the proof is particularly enlightening, I'm just going to skip this one. The next property is just a little bit of a time saver. It says that if we have two elements G and H of a group, 
and g times h is the identity element, then h has to be the inverse of g. Remember that in the definition of the inverse of g, we required both gh and hg to be the identity element. So what this is saying is that if you just know that gh is the identity, then already that's enough to conclude that h is the inverse of g. Well, to prove that this is true, under the hypothesis of the conditional statement, we only need to check that hg is the identity. First of all, I'll write hg as the identity element times hg. And then I'll write the identity element as g inverse times g. Now remember that from property three, I know that g has an inverse element in the group. And from uniqueness of inverses, I know that it's unique. So I can just call it g inverse here. Well, next, by generalized associativity, I can rearrange the parentheses so that I'm multiplying g and h together in the middle here first. Our assumption is that gh is the identity. So this just becomes g inverse e times g. And since g inverse e is just g inverse, this product is just g inverse g, which is the identity. Now that I know that both gh and hg are the identity, I can conclude, again using uniqueness of inverses, that this element h is actually equal to g inverse. Therefore, that completes the proof of this property. Now I have a very easy property, which says that for any group element g, the inverse of the inverse of g is just the element g itself. Please don't just take this for granted though. One of the difficult things about this subject is to learn to think about this abstractly. So even though you know that a property like this should hold, say for a non-zero real number, here I'm stating this in the context of any abstract group. And that's a much more general statement. The proof of this though is pretty easy. First of all, by the definition of G inverse, it's the element that when I multiply it by G, either from the right or from the left, I get the identity element. Now I guess because of property number five that I just showed you, you can just focus on the second equation here. Since G inverse times G is the identity, it implies that the inverse of G inverse is G. And that's exactly what I wanted to show. Therefore, this result holds for any element little g in any group capital G. Now for the last property, I want you to think about this. If you choose two elements g and h from a group g and multiply them together as g h, what is the inverse of that element? Now, if you said g inverse h inverse, then I have to warn you that that's actually not the correct answer in general. It is correct if g is an abelian group, but if g is not an abelian group, then g h inverse is h inverse g inverse, and that's not necessarily the same thing as g inverse h inverse. So you have to be a little careful. This is kind of what I mean about not taking things for granted when we're working in an arbitrary group. Some of the facts that we're used to holding true for familiar groups, like the non-zero reals under multiplication, just don't hold in general for all groups, and especially when we're working with non-abelian groups. So we have to be a little careful. So the property is that for any g and h and g, the inverse of gh is h inverse times g inverse. And to prove this, all I need to show in light of property number five from before is that when I multiply gh by h inverse g inverse, I get the identity element. Well, first of all, I'd like to use the generalized associative law to change the order of parentheses in this multiplication and first multiply the h and the h inverse that are on the inside. When I do that, I just get the identity element. And then whichever multiplication you choose to do first, this just becomes g times g inverse, which I know is the identity element. That proves that g h inverse is h inverse g inverse. Notice, however, that in this proof, I never tried to interchange the orders of the multiplications here because I don't know a priori that the binary operation is commutative. If I knew that it was commutative, I could have given a different proof. I could have just moved the g inverse over to the left and then I would have had g, g inverse, h, h inverse, which is also the identity. But that proof doesn't work in a non-abelian group. And that's the reason why we proved it this way. So just to emphasize what I said before, if g is a non-abelian group, then it's actually not true in general that g, h inverse is g inverse, h inverse. Of course, you can find some examples of elements g and h for which this is true, but in any non-abelian group, there will also be examples of g and h for which this is not true. Just to give you a concrete example with numbers, consider the group g of two by two matrices with real coefficients and determinant not equal to zero, where the group operation is multiplication of matrices. And take the two matrices, a equals one, two, zero, one, 
and b equals 2001. Now you can work out just by matrix multiplication and the formulas for the inverses of invertible 2 by 2 matrices what AB and AB inverse and A inverse and B inverse are. And you can verify for yourself, just as the property that we just proved claimed, that AB inverse is in fact equal to B inverse times A inverse. But the point here is that if you try to multiply the matrices in the opposite order by computing A inverse B inverse, you don't get the same answer. So here's an example to show you why you need to be careful with interchanging the order of multiplication when you're not sure that you're working in an abelian group. Okay, well, that's the end of this video. In the next two videos, we're going to look at a lot of new examples, and we're going to classify all groups of orders 1 through 8. We'll start in the next video with groups of orders 1 through 3.